Well, good morning, everyone, whether you're here online or in person, we want to thank you for being here this morning. Um, we had a great time last night with the movie Overcomer, um, and then we're starting off on a sermon series this morning, and Mark's going to be bringing us the first message in that this morning called Who Are You? And if you haven't seen the movie, that might not make a ton of sense, so if you have the opportunity to see the movie, if you'd like to watch the movie, we have a copy, and we provide the lend it out to you, so just let us know. Um, so some things coming up. Uh, through some prayer and discussion, uh, Mark and I were talking, and we're going to make some changes to Wednesday night for a little while. And we were going to start the Truth Project in June, but we're going to push that back, and we're going to have some time of worship and prayer and, and a devotion, and just really focusing on uh, praying for. And, and as I was talking with. Uh, Mark and Lori this morning, and, and I hadn't had a chance to talk with Diane about it or anybody else, but we need to be praying for our inner circle, our outer circle. So it's people, the inner circle is everybody that we're close to, outer circle, so it's acquaintances, people we've met, and then the, the larger group of people, and, and following that down and praying for individual things. And um, this morning, Mark had a headache, and instead of saying, like in the movie last night, I'll pray for you and walk away, literally going up and praying with them, whether it's in person, uh, online, through a text message, throwing that prayer out immediately, and then continuing to pray for them. And so that's what we want to do. We want to draw ourselves closer to prayer, uh, closer to God, because that's that communication that means so much. And then next Saturday, uh, starting at 9, we have the drop-off registration, 9.30 regular registration, at 10 o'clock we have racing for horse track racing. So we're looking forward to getting that uh, running for May. It's hard to believe we are closing in on the halfway point of the season already, but we're almost there. And so we're looking forward to that as well. And does anyone else have any announcements that I may have missed? Worship King practice is Thursday night, 7 o'clock right here. Um, so uh, we also have that going on. So let's, let's start, uh, before we go to our call for worship, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we just thank you that you help us overcome all things in our life, Father. You can define who we are, Father. And through the message today, and through the words that you've given uh, to Pastor Mark, Father, we just pray that we would hear those words, that they would resonate with us, that they would be words that would be life-changing, life-altering, ones that would draw us closer to you, Father. Father, let us hear it in your Son's precious and holy name. This morning's call to worship is from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And this is what Paul writes. He says, All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Now, one thing that I always find interesting about Paul's letters, and, and this is something that um, it's not a, a lifelong Revelation. This is just in, in recent study that Paul's writing and in, in, in his writing in the Greek, this starts off like a, a 11 verse uh, piece in the first chapter, but it's a run on sentence in Greek. It's just one long sentence. And this is just a piece of it that's broken down. And, and, and Paul is telling us in this very first portion of this sentence uh, about the spiritual blessing that we have in Christ. And he's also telling us uh, through this that it's not just about the Jewish people. It wasn't just for the Jewish people. It was for the Gentiles, for all of us. It's meant for all. And, and we have all, have all the benefits of knowing God right now. And if you saw the movie last night you, and you watched it as uh, she was writing down all the things that she is as a child of God, you know, some of those things is uh, benefits of knowing God is we have salvation. We have salvation, and we are adopted as His children, and we are given forgiveness. Uh, we have spiritual gifts that we can share with one another, and, and we're able to do God's will. And this gives us hope because we're living with Jesus, not just in the here and now, but forever. So we don't have to wait for these until we get to heaven. We get to enjoy these things now. And these are the are eternal. They're not just for now, but they are eternal. They follow us through this life and into our eternal life with God in heaven. 
And this is all because of Christ's victory on the cross. Father, we thank you for the victory that you gave Jesus on the cross, that he has taken our sins from us, and that through you we are defined, and, and we are who we are because of you, not because of anything of this world, Father. Father, I pray a special blessing on Pastor Mark this morning. I pray a blessing on the worship team this morning as they uh, bring us into worship this morning. And I pray a blessing upon our, our in-person and our online congregation, Father, the people that are, are watching and hearing and participating in your worship this morning. Because, Father, it is all for you. And, Father, we give it all to you. In Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Pastor Terry. You know, when uh, Terry was praying us in this morning, it reminded me of how awesome our God is. And Terry wasn't inviting in the Holy Spirit as in an abstract thought. He's real and he is alive. And so let's stand up and worship him. Let's worship a very much alive God. And my prayer this morning is that that Holy Spirit that he always sends to be with us every week so graciously, that we feel that amongst us today. And that if you're online today, I hope that the Holy Spirit will come to you and dwell with you where you're at because you are part of us. Amen? Amen.
very much for the music. It's awesome. So for those of you who were able to see the movie last night, it was an awesome movie, a uh, great time. And what we had, uh, you know, was a, a movie that really spoke to the human condition. And the question that came out of the movie that, that I'm focusing on today is, who are you? And it breaks down in three different parts. And, and we saw in the movie last night that uh, Coach Jonathan, well, he made this list. And he was asked, who are you? And he, he listed all these things out. Well, I'm, I'm a coach. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a father. And I'm a teacher. I teach history. And he went down through this list. And the very last thing on the list, he goes, well, I am a Christian. And, you know, so you got to say, well, well, what does that mean to you? And so when he was asked what that meant to him and everything, it kind of showed him that God was placed on the back burner. And so the other things came first. Basketball came first in his life over his family, over his church, over his God. Basketball was the number one thing that he, that he talked about. And so we got to kind of think about that when, when someone asks us, who are you? You know, all of us can come up with a list just like he did, you know? And we have to think about that. Well, you know, some of us are musicians. Some of us are IT people. Some of us are pastors. But do we say we're Christians first? And then all these things? Or is it really our human nature to kind of go to the things that occupy our time the most. And so as we go through the message today, I want you to think about that a little bit. I want you to think about the difference between what occupies our time the most and what occupies our heart the most. So I have three questions for you today. I always like to do this. It's kind of like being in school all over again. But I want you to answer these to yourselves as we go through the message today. Who do you know yourself to be? Who do you know yourself to be? These are kind of deep questions. Question number two. Who does the world think you are? Who does the world think you are? And who does God know you to be? Pretty deep questions. See, a lot of this is we have a lot of facades that we have. We, we put on these faces, and man, there's a commercial on TV of the person holding up a little paper sign with a smiley face on it. It's for some drug for, I don't know what, because <clears throat> I really don't pay attention that much. But see, we, we all have facades. We all have different identities. We all have pseudo-identities to who we are. And so I want you to think about that last night. Last night in the movie, we saw a lot of different dynamics in motion. We saw a, a stable home environment and a stable family life that was intersected with an unstable one. Moreover, we saw how stable lives, that even though they could be turned upside down, they survived through all of the issues that were facing them, all of the problems that were facing them. We saw that faith triumphed over fear. As most of the time town was exiting and they were they were thinking only one priority and they were only thinking of one thing. I need a basketball scholarship. I want to be on a winning team. And they all left. They all left their homes because that was the priority in their lives. So I have to ask you, who do you know yourself to be? Who does the world see you as you are? And who does God these really hit home when we think about it. Because see those people, they all had pseudo-identities that were actually driving their character and who they were. So we also saw on that last night a wonderful transformation. And I thought it was fantastic. From being a child who had very, very low self-worth, who felt rejected, abandoned, and was withdrawn and depressed, withdrawn into herself and she transformed into this vibrant young woman 
and it was wonderful. I, I mean, I, I brought the tissue, tissues out and put them up here on the, on the uh, corner of the desk last night because I figured if everybody else was like me, I didn't have dry eyes and I figured other people didn't either. And we saw a lot of different things in here of characters, people's character, not, not character in what they were portraying, but their character, who they were and who the world saw them to be in the movie last night. And so I mentioned last night that uh, as I was doing the message here and after I went through the movie, was, I was going through the movie and I was making notes like crazy. And then when I came to, to write the sermon, we had a sermon outline that came along with it. And then out the window it went and I said, here, this is what God was telling me about the movie last night. And that's what we're gonna hear today. So we saw that character is, is a large part a product of one's childhood environment and their relationship with their caregiver. Not necessarily a parent, in this case, but a caregiver. And see, we have to understand that adverse or hurtful circumstances growing up lead to that negative character traits that we saw, such as lying and stealing. And we witnessed that last night because of that low self-worth. They, they turn to things to try and, you know, kind of shore themselves up, make themselves feel good. So if they saw a shiny bottle or a, a watch or headphones or whatever, you know, they, they took that to try and make themselves feel better, to improve their self-worth. So this neglect and the condensation and, and spiteful language, they, they all cause and provoke low self-esteem. And children come to believe that their personal qualities and way of being are undesirable and worthy of reproach. And that's really, really dangerous because if they repress those traits and develop feelings uh, that are based on it, it becomes fear and remorse and insecurity. And these feelings that they continue on into adulthood, if they don't change, they remain unchanged and unchecked. They can be very, very destructive. And it may lead to acting out against others and the in inability to verbalize their emotions to other people. And a lot of times they become socially disconnected. And we call that condition sociopathic. And sociopathic, when you're thinking about someone who has sociopathic tendencies, you, you think about criminals and you think about people who act out against others violently. And so we have to be very, very careful to make sure that our children are not brought up in those types of environments, that they're not subjected to those things. When we have these traits present, they can lead to many forms of addiction, an attempt to numb down that feeling of inadequacy that they get. And so when we look at a lot of the people, and they've done a lot of studies uh, about these kind of things, and I, I worked with Foundation Two Crisis Center, and, uh, I was on their board of directors for many years, and I'm still a, a member of their board. Uh, I'm a director emeritus for Foundation Two, and we do crisis, crisis counseling. And this was started back in 1972 because of the problems that the kids were facing in high school. And there's a group of, of students from Kennedy High School and a group of students from Jefferson High School that went together to try and form a group to help the other kids that are struggling. And that's what Foundation 2 is. It has become today. And it's someone that can come in there and take kids that are, that are having a hard time and struggling with things, and it's there to build them back up and to give them the resources they need to change the negative behavior patterns that they kind of fell into. And so when we take a look at those kind of things and we contrast that with someone who's had the ability to develop that good sense of character, their lives can be very, very, very different. See, good character traits include traits like loyalty, honesty, courage, integrity, fortitude, these are very important virtues that build that be behavior, that good behavior pattern that helps them become a very relative adult in later life. Other positive traits that have less to do with uh, 
things that we face in the world today, but those good character traits, those things that we have when we have a good character, we choose to do the right thing because he or she believes it to be the morally right thing to do at that point in time. It gives us that moral basis, and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago in my sermon, that our moral basis has been destroyed over the last 80 years. It's been in a decline the whole time. And as our moral basis for society declines, the number of people who find church being relative declines as well. But we noticed in the movie last night where we had a, a family that was centered themselves on good moral behavior that was based in the church, who prayed together, who ate dinner together, who played sports together. They communed with one another. You see, even though the fact that their lives got turned upside down, they went to God in prayer. They went to God in prayer. And what happened then? Well, their lives were, didn't, none of those circumstances changed. However, if you notice, their attitude didn't go down. Their attitude didn't go down. They actually came in to support one another through everything that they were going through. So those positive character traits have less to do with morals, but still define that person's character. For example, being persistent or creative can be excellent attributes, but are not moral imperatives. So it's not a moral imperative, but it is an outlet by which they can express themselves and express their, their emotions in an effective and a constructive way, not a beast. So when a person possesses good character, it's exhibited through his or her words and actions. It's not limited to a single value, but the traits are demonstrated in the good choices they make and the bad choices that they avoid. See, that's the key. That's the key. Those traits are demonstrated in the good choices they make and the bad choices. So when we think about how others see us, it's largely based on our character traits, good or bad. And it's this view of us that the world uses to judge us as to the kind of person that we are. And then they form that opinion of what your worth is in society. Right or wrong, right or wrong as to who you are right now, based solely on those character traits. And see, there's a sticking point that I've always had with this uh, kind of thing about the issues with your past is, your past is your past. And no, you can't travel back in time and change things, even if you do own a DeLorean. <laughs> so, um, so what we have to do is we have to think about this. What this means is, you need to overcome your past, and you need to move on. Build a new character. In other words, we need to die to ourselves, to our old life, and we need to start anew. Start anew. And this is what we witnessed last night in the, in the film with Thomas Hill. So Thomas Hill went down a very destructive path. He got into addictive behavior. He had bad character traits. And those bad character traits are what people were remembering of him when they brought up his name. Grandma thought of him in a horrible, terrible way. But see, as he said, I'm not the person that I used to be. She was still judging him on those past traits. What we need to understand, and this is very, very crucial, is your identity is not tied to what others think of you. Your identity is what you choose to give your heart to. And I talked about this earlier on today. Your identity is not tied to what others think of you. It is tied to what you decide to give your heart to. What you decide to give your heart to then that becomes your identity. And when I was talking about who are you, who do you know yourself to be, and hiding behind facades, 
what you choose to give your heart to becomes your character. And your character is what the other people know you to be. So the choice is yours and yours alone as to what your identity to be. Who do you want to know yourself to be? I wanted to ask you, who do you want others to know you to be? And when you ask yourself that question right now, now ask yourself, is that who you are presenting to them? Or is that who you're presenting to them? So Thomas had given his life to Christ and got a new identity and in Christ. His name was still the same, but he was not the same person. He got a new identity. He got a new life in Christ. He had to overcome his past in order for that new identity to be seen by others. Now, those who didn't know him in that past life, how did they see him? They saw him as a man of God. They knew his identity to be a man of God, a good man. And in the end of the film, we heard that I have come to know your father as a very good person and as a good friend. See, it wasn't judge anything on his past or who he used to be. He took on a new life and a new character and a new identity through Christ and in Christ. In Jesus' day, you had the Pharisees and Sadducees that were really great at passing judgment on others rightly or wrongly, when in fact they were rarely fair and they were really sad, you see, because they didn't know Jesus. Sad, you see. Okay. It's a dad joke. Oh, right. yeah, wow. I just like one in there because dad's not here today, and so I had to kind of, you know, move one in real quick. They were sad, you see. So, all right, how can we go? Uh, the problem was they were so fixated on the law that no one could really be judged as good. And so we had a society that was repressed by the people who were leading the society. And the people were being repressed by the church, by the people, by the spiritual leaders of the day. They were being repressed by the very people who should have been there to lift them up and to give them a good example of what being a godly person was all about. So they were fixated on the law that, that no one could be judged good. And this led people to, be, to become very jaded as a society. So when we take a look at the scriptures in John 3, 1 through 5, it says, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you that no one can enter into the kingdom of heaven without being born of the water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life. But the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. The wind blows wherever it wants. And just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it goes to, you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Well, how are these things possible? Nicodemus asked. Well, the snake in the wilderness replied Jesus. You are respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things? I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so everyone who believes in him 
can have eternal life. Now, as we read this, if we don't really know the context around it, it might be kind of confusing. We might kind of stumble through this thing. But see what Jesus was saying. He says, you guys are so fixated on, on things you go through life with blinders on that even when you see the truth and you hear the truth, you won't believe the truth. You won't believe on these things because you're so fixated on these things. And that was the problem with the Pharisees. Is they were so fixated on things. That they didn't want to accept anything but what they knew. They were so fixated on that law. So what Jesus was referring to was comes from Exodus, and it was from the Exodus from Egypt. The natives were out there and they were growing restless and they started complaining about having to eat manna all day long, out in the wilderness, out in the desert, and they were ready to return back to the mud pits in slavery rather than being thankful for God for providing for them and delivering them from bondage. So they started complaining amongst themselves and they decided they didn't want Moses to lead them any longer. So they take matters into their own hands and they just stop and leave. Well, one evening, poisonous snakes entered into their camp and then started biting them and they started dying. So they ran back to Moses. Now, understand, this is the guy that they were ready to leave. They didn't want to follow anymore. They were tired of all this. They were ready to go back into slavery. So they ran back to Moses and asked him to save us. So Moses prayed to God, and God said, Moses, here's what I want you to do is I want you to form an image of a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. And then when anyone prays, and gets bit by a snake and looks up to that pole, they will be saved. They won't die. And anyone who doesn't look up to that pole will surely die. And so when, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he was talking about that. And Moses prayed to God and told him to fashion that snake and put it up there as a sign. They didn't know and understand that God was in control with them in the desert time. And the only way to be saved was by God. And it took an act of faith to be saved. Notice now that God didn't do away with the snakes. They were still there and they were still biting people. But if they had faith and did what they were told to do, and look up at that snake, the very thing that was biting them and killing them off. He put that symbol of death up on a pole for them to look upon. And when they looked upon that, up on that pole, and they looked up and had faith that if they trusted in God, that they wouldn't die. Sound familiar? God wanted to have a relationship between himself and the people that showed that he was their God. And just because he released them from slavery didn't mean that they had a relationship with him. And he was trying to get them back on track, get them back into that relationship with God. And see, in today's church, likewise, we have that today, that people think they're Christians because, well, I go to church and I fill a pew or a chair. I feel if you were a chair. But see, that doesn't mean they have a relationship with God. The number of people claiming to be born again has never been higher than what it has been today, in today's numbers. Yet a poll taken among the so-called born-again Christians found that 28% of them believe that Jesus sinned just like they did when he lived here on earth. And one-third of those claiming to be born again also believe that if someone was good long enough, they'd have a place in heaven just by being able to be good and do good deeds. See, maybe we just don't understand what it means to be born again. And it's very obvious that this is a very, very important fact because Jesus stated it outright in John 3, 7, you must be born again. And what that means is, it means that we have to shed that old life. We have to start a life 
dedicated to serving God. But we seem to miss that point. It's pretty easy for us to serve other gods in his presence. And so when we think about that, and we think about, you know, what are the things that come into your life first thing in the morning, and you wake up first thing and grab your cell phone and start going through social messaging? That could be a God in your life. Or you can't wait. You put everything aside and go home and see a TV show. Forget everything else. Whatever it happens to be, these things that will replace God in our lives as being the main thing, what we give our heart to, becomes our identity. If we're giving our heart to social media, we're allowing social media to drive our life and not God. If we give our heart to television or a show or whatever it happens to be, or basketball, or soccer, or whatever it happens to be. When we replace God in our heart, then that is what our character becomes, and that's what our life is going to be focused upon. And so God wants us to get back into that relationship from Him. So, what did He do for those people? Stumbling around in the desert, complaining that He was giving them food in the middle of the desert every day to sustain them? water coming from rocks in the desert <laughs> is because they replaced God with selfish means. So we need to get back to having a life that is centered on God. Being born again means to shed the old life, start a life dedicated to serving God. Just like the Pharisees, they knew the law, but they missed the point. The point was having a relationship with God. And that relationship was more important than the law. And that's what Jesus was trying to tell Nicodemus that day. And you notice that Nicodemus didn't come to him in the daytime when he was preaching in the public square. He came to him at night so none of the rest of the people could see. But what did he do? He recognized the fact that that God had sent Jesus by his miraculous deeds and his signs. And it was obvious to him that God had anointed him to do these things. Yet he missed the point. The entire point. So Jesus spoke these words to a man named Nicodemus who was a Pharisee. And we usually see the Pharisees. Whenever you read the Bible, we see those Pharisees in a negative light. And, you know, I have to admit Jesus leveled some of his most scathing words toward the scribes and Pharisees in there. He called them a brood of vipers, poisonous snakes. And among other things, he called them whitewashed tombs. Whitewashed tombs. He talked about how they majored on the externals, the law, completely missing the point about what the law was about. And the law was about being a godly people and serving God. But they missed that point completely. Now the Pharisees, you know, just to clarify things, they were a pretty admirable group of people. They never numbered more than 6,000 at a time, and they took a solemn vow before three witnesses in public that they would devote every moment of their lives to obeying the Ten Commandments. Now, not that any of them were successful, but it's what they attempted to do. <laughs> They took the law of God very seriously, but unfortunately they took it too seriously and it caused them to be separated from God as a result. See, to them, the law became God. The law became God. God sent Jesus into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. We find that in John 3:17. God sees us as his greatest creation. Who does God know us to be? He knows us as his greatest creation. The scriptures say we're fearfully and wonderfully made and that we are a child of the Most High God. Do we act that way? Do we act that way? Is that our identity? A child of the Most High God? Hmm. So I ask you, who does God know you to be? 
Because God knows our every move. He knows the number of hairs on our head before we even born. Who does God know you to be? See, God knows that we are flawed. He knows we're going to screw up. And he knows that we're all going to sin. Yet he sees us as Jesus sees us. With love. That's why he sent Jesus to fulfill the law. To fulfill the law. And bring us out of bondage of sin and death. When we have that relationship with the living God and Jesus, we have the fulfilled life that God wants us to have. He wants us to have that fulfilled life. And when we live out the life that Jesus has shown for us to live, we will not have a flawed character, but we will have a new life in Him. We need to understand that we are all children of God. Hannah came to the realization that she was a child of God. She had worth. It transformed her life. If we understand that we are a child of God, we understand the gifts that He gave us in Ephesians it talks about that. She had to read the first two chapters of Ephesians. I'll get that to a minute. When we see the life that was restored to Hannah in the movie, it was because she was born again in Jesus Christ. She said, I am a child of God. And then she lived it out for the rest of her life. Just like her father did. Just like her father. When he gave his life over, he was a different person. He was a new person in Christ. When her father turned from his addictions and entered into a life of serving Jesus, he was given a restored life. Yes, he was blind. Yes, he lost everything. But through it all, he kept his faith and was restored to his daughter, and he was assured of a place in heaven. Hannah read these verses and it changed her life. Maybe we need to dust off the Bibles and we need to turn to Ephesians 1 and start reading. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. That was our call to worship today. Even before he made the world, God loved us and he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ this is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure so we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son. Forgave us of our sins through the blood of his son. He has showered his kindness upon us with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. And furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance. And he makes everything work out according to his plan. So I ask you again, who do you know yourself to be? Tough one for me. Who does the world think you are? Who does God know you to be? Let us pray. Lord of unfailing love, you are good and faithful, overflowing with steadfast love. 
Our world is in crisis, Lord. We are in crisis, Lord. And we need you to change our hearts. Help us to restore trust in you and re redeem relationships, O God. We are not capable of bringing communities back together, but nothing, nothing is impossible for you. Give us the wisdom and help to see them receive that gift of restoration for families, for communities, for races, for broken lives, where someone needs forgiveness, give them the strength to forgive. When someone needs to admit fault, give them the humility to admit fault. Embolden us today to reach out. Empower us to provide help and equip us today to be your hands and feet. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your power, for your grace and mercy, and for your everlasting love. Amen. song came into mind as, as Mark was praying. <laughs> it was just because you're the music guy. And, and it's a Matt Maher song, Lord I Need You. Lord I Need You. Oh, I need you. To respect others. We choose to, maybe it's just opening a door for your wife or, or kids, your mom or your dad, or just helping others. But it's about making a conscious decision to follow Jesus. And He will let the Holy Spirit work through you. We have to allow for that. And it started on the night that He was betrayed when He broke bread and He said, This is my body broken for you. Take. Same way, towards the end of the meal, he took the cup and he filled it. He said, This is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you. And he's telling us that it's shed for our sins, that we are forgiven, that no matter where we've been, whether we have stolen, whether we have uh, been fighting with others, whether we have been incarcerated, whether we've done things in the dark that no one but God knows about, He forgives us for those things because of what Jesus did on the cross. So as you take your communion with this morning, ask God through the Holy Spirit to work through your life, to change you, to help you overcome the things of this world. body of Christ given for you. The 
blood of Christ shed for you. Father God, as we close out our time together this morning, as if we close out this time of worship, Father, let us take the things that we have sung at the beginning of the service, add in the words that you gave Pastor Mark for us to hear this morning and tie them into the music that we will close out, and let it be our offering to you, may it be pleasing to you, Father, but may it also change lives. In Jesus' name. throw everybody a slight curve. Sometimes God tells pastors to do things that he doesn't always let everybody else know. And I just want to say 
short version of Let It Rise. Uh, and uh, I, the band probably doesn't even have it. I didn't say we, we did have it. See, God told us all. <laughs> Tell Terry, maybe, but it's all the rest of it. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the songs of Yeah. 
we ask you that you would use us to be a blessing to others who are in need or facing difficulties. Make us a channel of your blessing, Lord, a channel through whom your love, peace, and joy would flow out from through us to others. May we be your hands to bless others, and may you guide our feet to places where we can go and be a blessing. May our speech be so that we may speak your words of comfort and encouragement and speak the truth in love. Give us the grace, enable us and embold us, and give us the encouragement to be available when others are in need, Lord. We pray that you would increase in our lives and that we may decrease before others so that the blessings that you pour out through us to others may draw each and every one of them closer into your arms, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, that your grace is sufficient for all your children, including all that are facing persecutions and dangers and in many parts of this torn world. But Lord, we are all your brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are all one in him. And the pain that an individual believer suffers becomes a communal distress for the body of Christ. And so, Lord, we lift up all those who are having to contend with so many dangers, difficulties, pain, and suffering, and we ask comfort and strength to each person who is suffering. Draw close to each and every one so that your strength may persevere in these troublesome times, and in doing so, bring glory to you and serve as faithful witness to those who are lost in their sins. Help us to show forth your grace and goodness as a beacon to others. Comfort and surround each hurting heart. Bless those who are in need of healing. Bring relief to those who are in need and keep each one of us firm in the faith that we have through you, Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Lord, that there's not one of your children who is lost to your eyes. And we lift each and every one up to you. In your precious and holy name we pray.